three months. Do I want to stick around with you for three months or do I want to go someplace else? What if I'm a buyer that needs a loan? Imagine going to the bank and saying, uh, I, need to, I want to buy this property. And the bank says, okay, looks good. I like the appraised, uh, appraisal. Everything looks fine. When are you going to close? Well, I don't know. Maybe three months? Maybe six months? Maybe eight months? Is the bank going to lock in the loan rate on your loan and keep that rate for you? Not a chance. Because mortgage rates go up and down. They're going to give you the market rate. So if it goes up, that's what you're going to pay. If it goes down, maybe you can get a better deal. But it makes it difficult because the lenders are so slow to move. Number two, it's going to, be, uh, it's going to have a negative effect on your credit rating for three years. Here's the real key, though, that I talk very uh, uh, passionately with my clients about. When you got your loan to begin with, you had to fill out a 1003, which is a loan application form. How many people have gotten loans on houses? Not too many homeowners? Yeah, we got homeowners here. You had, to, you had to fill out a 1003. Most of the time, these loans were stated income loans. How much do you make? I used to call these things liar loans. Because nobody's checking. I made uh, five million dollars last month. You can put whatever you want down there. Now, if I say I made five million dollars last month and I'm a janitor, somebody's probably going to say, eh, "I don't think that works." But if you put down more money than you actually earned on your 1003, your loan application, and nobody checked it, guess what? When you ask for the, the short sale, now they're going to check your financial situation. They're going to ask for tax returns and financial statements. And they're going to look, their, their legal department is going to look at this stuff and say, oh, wait a minute. When he got this loan, he said he was making $350,000 a year. All his financial information that he gave us to consider the, uh, the uh, short sale says he's only making $150,000 a year. Guess what? What do we call that? Fraud. Thank you, sir. You get the, you get the uh, award today. Fraud. You lied to the lender. That's federal offense and a state offense. You could go to jail for that. So I always say to my client, you've got to make sure when you're going to for the short sale that you didn't lie to the lender to begin with to get that loan because if they find out now, and they will, they're coming after you. So be careful. So they're going to audit your loan representations made on your 1003. And then the tax implications, this is the interesting one. People don't understand that when you do a short sale, when, the, your, when, debt, when debt is forgiven under the United States Internal Revenue Code, that's income to you. Now, I know this sounds like I'm, I'm talking from a Lewis Carroll, Mad, Mad Hatter story. Debt forgiveness is income. Make sense? Only to the government does this make sense. <laughs> You got relieved of indebtedness for $100,000. As far as the government is concerned, somebody wrote you a check for $100,000, you have to pay income tax on that. Stupid as it may seem, that's the law. Now, there is a law that's out there that I think is sunsetting this year called the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act. And what the Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act says that if you got forgiven that $100,000 that I was talking about, that won't be income to you because of the special law that was passed. But as I say, I think it sunsets this year. So you gotta be really careful when you're going into these things that you're clear that there won't be a tax ramification on your short sale. Talk to your CPA, please. Don't talk to me, I'm not a CPA. I wasn't very good with numbers, so I went to law school. Talk to your CPA and say, is this gonna impact me and if so, how much? Because nobody wants a surprise and have Uncle Sam or Uncle Jerry with their hand up on April 15 saying, you owe us a ton of taxes. Okay, there's also a concept that's going on in the real estate market now called real estate, um, real estate owned property or REO. That's what I, that's how, I'm gonna use that term, REO. And REO is, is properties that are owned by the bank. The bank foreclosed the property back. Now the bank's going to sell them. So they acquired title uh, through foreclosure, deed in lieu of foreclosure, tax sale, or perhaps corporate housing. 
usually you can buy these things at a lower price. The bank wants to unload them. People, you know, people, there's this constant um, uh, miscommunication about what a bank wants. A bank doesn't want your property if you if you defaulted on your loan. They don't want that. You know why? They're not in the property management management and sale business. When a bank forecloses on your property, they have to maintain that property. They don't cut the lawn, clean the pool, do all the stuff necessary to keep that property safe, then they can get fined by the government. So the, the banks want to unload this stuff as quickly as possible, so you usually get a lower price. You're usually dealing with a bank representative. However, the timing sometimes is really cumbersome. Banks would move like dinosaurs. You know, they're not really quick to make a really quick decision. And the, may, the bank may want to use their own forms, and I'll tell you why they want to use their own forms. Because if you're using the standard forms in the industry, the, the bank has to make, should make, certain representations and warranties about the condition of the property. The bank's going to say, ah, what do we know about the property? We just made a loan. We are now own the property, but we don't know any. We don't know anything about the property. So they'll give you a three or four, maybe ten page list of stuff that they're not responsible for. They want to get rid of the property. It's your, your, uh, it's your problem to make sure that the property is sufficient for your uses. You've got to do all investigations. Don't depend on the bank to tell you the condition of the property. They're not responsible for doing that. You tell me to sit down and run another time because I told, I told you this, this could go on for hours. When the property gets foreclosed, you're going to get something called cash for keys. What does that mean? Somebody's going to knock on your door because you're still living in the property right after the foreclosure. You're still sitting there. You haven't made, I know people who've been in properties for three years and never made payment. So you're in there after it forecloses. Somebody's going to knock on your door and say, hey, I'm Joe Schmo. I'm from the bank. We'd like you to get out of here. Now, can you can you just throw the guy out? Of course not. Bring the police and throw him out? Of course not. You got to go through the legal process. You got to go through the the eviction process. So what the banks want to do is they want you out, so they can market the property and get rid of it. So they'll say to you, "We'll give you money if you leave. <laughs> we'll give you maybe twenty five hundred bucks, maybe more. Maybe you can negotiate." And we'll give you that money, cash. You tell us when you're going to leave. But you got to leave. When you leave, and you're leaving, you're walking out the door. Here's the cash. Because if they if they if you don't go, they're going to have to hire somebody like me to kick you out, and they have to pay me to kick you out. And then if you raise some issue that's not that that gives you maybe some right, then you're going to be in court for a longer period of time. And eventually you'll get out, but it'll probably take 30 to 45 days. They'd rather have you out sooner than later, and they're willing to pay for it. Uh, now, if you reject cash for keys, if the bank can't get cash for keys, the banks have to be really careful because of these four, three exceptions that I've listed. I'm going to speed it up a little bit. Uh, you can't lock the person out if, the, if uh, you're trying to get them out of the house, and you need a legal court order and a sheriff to evict the person from the uh, residence. Personal property is a heavily litigated area. Let's assume that you get the person out and they leave something. They leave the Steinway piano. Or they leave all their personal belongings. You can't just take that stuff down to the Goodwill. You can't just give it to your buddy. There's all kinds of stuff that you have, you have to do. Somebody called us up the other day and there was hundreds of thousands of dollars left behind. And the landlord wanted, to, uh, wanted us to uh, to do something about it. We went through the, the California statutes and said, it's going to take you a ton of money and a long time to get rid of this. So you got to be really careful about that because if you break the law, then you're the bad guy, even though the other guy left his stuff behind. Okay, asset pro uh, protection. How many people have income producing properties, like another property, an apartment complex, a fourplex, that sort of thing? Your title to that property should be held in the name of a limited liability company or a corporation. Now, I switched gears here. I'm going straight from real estate to asset protection. We all work really hard for what we have. We kind of like to keep the stuff that the government doesn't take from us. If you buy an income producing property and you don't put it in an LLC or a corporation, if the tenant has got a gripe, what are they going to do? They're going to sue you individually. 
you need the protection of a limited liability company or a corporation. So they have to sue the limited liability company or the corporation because under California law, that limited liability company or corporation is considered a person under the law, independent of the people who own it. So if you don't do that, you run the risk that you'll be dragged into the lawsuit individually. Let's say it's a big lawsuit. I just I was talking to some people over here. My client just got uh, sued about three or four months ago. He just tried the case about a month ago. $40 million. He had it in his name. He doesn't have $40 million. He had it in, in, in an LLC or a corporate name. I had it felt all a heck of a lot better. You're going to hear about insurance today. One of the things I would say to you is have as much insurance as you can afford if you own property. That would be life insurance, auto insurance, long-term health care policy insurance in case you have a debilitating one day, one day you wake up and you find out you got a horrible disease. You don't have medical coverage that's going to cover it. The long-term health care policy can protect you against catastrophic illness or injury. <coughs> Put your uh, assets in an irrevocable trust because anybody that gets Medicaid uh, or Medicare payments from the government, when they die, the government looks back and says, did you get any government payments? And they look back for a three-year period. And if you got those payments, your estate, the assets in your estate are going to be used to pay those payments back to the government. If you divest your stuff uh, and put it in an irrevocable trust, it's complicated. I, I don't have time to go through it. You can get away from the government coming back and asking for those payments to be repaid. I have under, under their umbrella policy. I have an umbrella policy. I have e and insurance for my business. I have life insurance. I have auto. I've got everything I need. And then on top of that, I've got a $5 million umbrella policy. And it's, it's, it's exactly what it says, umbrella. All these other policies have to be in certain uh, uh, denominations, and then you have the umbrella that goes, if you, if you run out of insurance below the umbrella, then the umbrella kicks in. It's very cheap. Let's say, what's an umbrella cost? About a couple hundred bucks? Oh, 190 for the vendor. Yeah, very, very, very little money that you have to spend. But what we're trying to do while you go through life is protect the assets that you accumulate. Because all you need is one big colossal lawsuit and you can be wiped out. So if you hide your stuff, I don't hide, hide it being a, a, a bad thing, but you put your stuff in an LLC for a corporation, you can protect your assets. I was talking uh, to Frank earlier about a case that we had. A real estate agent is driving to Office Depot to get some supplies. He has a home office and he kills somebody in his automobile. So the attorney representing the, um, the, the, the decedent sued not only the guy that ran into the person and killed him, but he sued his real estate broker saying, you were doing business. You're on a business trip. So if you're on a business trip doing business, then the broker is responsible for it as well. I got him out of the case, but those are the things that happen all the time. Guy falls off a roof, not supposed to be on the roof, sues the homeowner because the roof's unsafe. You're in California, very litigious state. California takes the position, and I don't agree with it, that everybody should have insurance. And if you have insurance, then insurance will cover everybody's injury, and you don't have to worry about your own assets. That's the game that's played in the state. So if you want to protect your assets, have as much insurance as you can afford. Questions, anybody? You guys were awfully silent today. Yeah. Yeah, first question is, uh, somebody mentioned that using LLC uh -huh. is not really a very good idea if compared to a a good umbrella. Is it true or not? Rather than having an umbrella instead? Yeah. Well, I don't know because here's